Hi everyone, and welcome to Hear the Rare, Voices of the DIPG Community. My name is Rachna Prasad. In this week's episode, we are talking to Dr. Nick Vitanza, who is a pediatric neuro-oncologist at Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Vitanza's career is dedicated to the care of children with central nervous system, or CNS, tumors, and specifically the study of diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, DIPG, and diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M mutant DMGs. During his pediatric oncology fellowship with doctors Elizabeth Rayatz and Bill Carroll, his lab work led him to a COG clinical trial and an ASPHOS's Young Investigator Early Career Award. He then completed a pediatric neuro-oncology fellowship at Stanford University, where he continued as a postdoc in Dr. Michelle Monge's neuroscience slash DIPG lab. There, he helped to identify combinatorial epigenetically targeted drug strategies in DIPG that was published in Cancer Cell and provided the preclinical foundation for a phase one clinical trial. In 2016, he joined the faculty at Seattle Children's where, under doctors Mike Jensen and Julie Park, he served as a CNS CAR T-cell lead, helping to oversee one of the largest pediatric CNS CAR T-cell programs in the world. Dr. Vitanza was also my brother's first doctor and also serves on the board of the Mithil Prasad Foundation. He is a very close mentor and friend to our family. I had such a great time interviewing Dr. Vitanza and I hope you enjoy episode number 12 of Hear the Rare. So can you just um, explain to begin with your path to becoming a doctor and then um, how you specifically got introduced to DIPG, DMG, um, and what that was like for you? Sure. So when pretty much throughout my whole life, I was interested in two major things, either journalism or medicine. And I knew if I was going to do medicine, it was definitely going to be pediatrics. Um, my dad was neonatologist and so took care of like premature babies and young infants. Um, and he really didn't like academic medicine. He liked just like working hands on with patients. So I kind of thought that's always what I would do. I thought like maybe general pediatrics, mm. just being clinic a lot. Um, and it wasn't until I did my pediatric residency at Stony Brook in New York um, that I got to work with a great oncology team there and really see the academic side to pediatrics. Um, and at that point, I had never worked in a lab. I had never done like research related work. But as I got interested in oncology, I knew I wanted to go to some place that had a big research program. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, I also really wanted to stay in New York. Mm -hmm. So I was really lucky to get into NYU's oncology fellowship program. And there I worked with Bill Carroll and Elizabeth Rates, who are like giants in the field of pediatric leukemia. Mm -hmm. And I worked in Bill's lab doing leukemia research. And that was really my first time like hands-on pipetting and doing laboratory work. Mm -hmm pretty quickly fell in love with that and knew I wanted to do that, but also started to pretty early on, uh, thought that I wanted to take care of children with brain and spinal cord tumors. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a general interest in all of the neuro tumors. And, you know, it was really impactful working with the patients, both inpatient and outpatient, um, getting to work with kids from when they were first diagnosed and really ill through treatment, which involved a lot of teams, which I liked being able to interact with a lot of different sides of the hospital. Um, and then also getting to have a close relationship with kids and the families. Mm -hmm. And then for at least some of the kids get to continue a really close relationship because the follow-up periods are so intense because you know, we take care of some diseases where unfortunately we don't have a cure right from the beginning. And then for the tumors that we do have a cure, often if the tumor does come back, then we don't have a cure anymore. Okay. So it's a very heightened state for those families, even when they're disease free, because they know what it would mean if it recurred. Mm. Um, and so you continue this kind of intense relationship with these families. Um, and I really liked all of that spectrum of care. I think I specifically got interested in taking care of children with DFPG when I was working with Jeff Allen at NYU um, Dr. Allen is a neuro-oncologist who is really like one of the people who started to treat pediatric brain tumors differently than adult brain tumors. Mm -hmm. And as part of a generation with like him and Jonathan Finley, where they essentially 
kind of made the entire field that we live in now. And they made a bunch of clinical observations about how children would do that now has been backed up by like genetic testing, but they realized there were these differences just because they were really good clinical neuro oncologists. Um, and it was great to work with him and spend time. And during our neuro oncology clinic, um, I probably only had like a really cursory understanding of what DIPG was. It's just not one of those things you learn in medical school. Like you just, you barely learn pediatrics, you barely learn oncology and almost all of it is leukemia in adults. And so I think I knew DIPG existed, but he took me aside and he said, um, we have this young girl. Um, she just got diagnosed at another place, but doesn't have a full understanding of what's going on. And they're here for a really an initial visit to talk about prognosis and everything. It's a DIPG. And I knew that this would be a difficult conversation. Right. Uh, but he, I, I just walked in the room with him and he introduced me and I sat down next to him and he started talking to this family and he pulled up the MRI and he showed them where the tumor was and said, this is in the pond. This is a really tough location. This is really aggressive. And then I kind of thought he would talk more about that, but right away said, and this is a tumor that we don't have any cures for. So your daughter is going to die from this tumor. And it was like the fourth sentence. And I had never been in a conversation like that before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had done a lot of new diagnosis talks for leukemia and other solid tumors where you throw out the cure rate. Oh, it's about 90%, but we'll have to learn more specific from genetics and that could change. And okay. this is going to be really aggressive, but you still have a more likely chance you'll be cured. And I hadn't been, I hadn't seen a conversation where a family heard this is cancer and mm -hmm. there's no cure just a couple sentences apart. And, you know, looking at the family's face was just like impossible. Like you see like the light leave their eyes and that they knew something was bad. They didn't know how bad mm -hmm. they weren't ready to hear it. And things yeah. kind of just like glaze over. And I just immediately thought like, it's impossible that we live in a world where this is like situation. Like, yeah. This is insane. Nobody should be having these conversations. It should be impossible that we can do so many things. Mm -hmm. And we put families in a situation where we have to hear this. Like yeah. there has to be a chance of something. Um, and then Dr. Allen did a great job of talking about what clinical trials were available and what the options were. And we gave that patient standard radiation and mm -hmm. she passed away exactly 11 months from diagnosis, which is exactly, you know, the average. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and as soon as I walked out of that room, I read every article on DAPG that I could read. And I looked at every place where I could go to train in DAPG. And at the time, one of the people who still is, but at the time was even more on her own was Michelle Manje, who was doing, you know, developing models, trying new drugs, trying to understand what the mutation would do translationally, not just doing genetic studies and subgrouping tumors, which a lot of people were doing, but really thinking on what are the discoveries we can make that would impact the child. Mm -hmm. And without ever having talking, talked to her or actually even having seen her speak at that point, um, I could tell that was her focus. Mm -hmm. And so I always wanted to be a New Yorker. I thought I would be a lifelong New Yorker. There was no question about that in my mind, <laughs> but she was at Stanford. And so I was like, well, I'll apply to Stanford and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a really good experience interviewing there and eventually accepted a position there. And I only talked with her briefly before I went, but um, they were really generous and that I got to do a two year neuro oncology fellowship where I spent one year taking care of patients and spending a small amount of time in the lab. And then a second year that was really lab based. And that's mm -hmm. where I got to really like focus on how to grow DIPG models in the mm -hmm. lab, understand how we take samples from patients, unfortunately, when they pass away, but really generously donate their tumors, how we can develop models in some of those patients. And then a lot of the stand, standard studies that I still use now in the lab are things that I use, learned from Michelle. Um, but that's kind of how I, I got to where I am. Cool. And do you think that like getting involved with research and DIPG kind of come hand in hand? Or do you think like some people do have a choice of like just being more of a clinician for these types of tumors? Yeah, I think, um, you know, pediatric brain tumor patients have really complex care and a total spectrum of needs. Like right now, 
out of the five or six DIPG patients that I'm primarily taking care of that are primarily based in Seattle, mm-hmm. um, probably half of them, it would be hard for you to know they had a deficit. Mm-hmm. Um, they're walking around. I have a three-year-old who the family just sent me pictures of him, like running around his house <laughs> and playing doctor and listening to his dad's chest with a stethoscope. And you wouldn't know he had any mm-hmm. abnormality. Um, we have another young woman on our CAR T-cell trials that's in her ninth month of treatment who I think most people would interact with her and not know that she had an issue going on. Mm-hmm. But then the other half are really affected kids who need regular swallowing support and home support, uh, you know, are often in wheelchairs and need something else. Um, feeding is challenging. Speech is challenging. So they need special boards to be able to convey their thoughts in a way that's like, makes them feel like they still have some control in their situation. So all that to say, there's a huge part of pediatric neuro-oncology and DIP, DIPG care that is just clinical. Mm-hmm. And we have to have people who are really, really good at that. Mm-hmm. I think one of the hardest things transitioning to being like primarily 80 or 90% of the lab is that I'm just not able to have the same personal relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, I remember at Stanford where a lot of the patients had my cell phone number and I was mm-hmm. texting with the patient or their families all the way through their yeah. care. Um, and when I started here at Seattle Children's, it was the same way where I was essentially taking care of the majority of our DAPG patients and, you know, walking them through the new diagnosis talk and then mm-hmm. going to their funeral. Um, and there's not enough time to be able to do all those things well in a way that patients deserve. Yeah. So we definitely need still people who I would consider DIPG researchers, right. but are just more clinically oriented and can partner with labs and partner with other things. Right. But their home base is really like the clinical taking care of kids with DIPG. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and then you mentioned your CAR T cell trial. So I just wanted to know more about that and then why you think it's promising, but then also the challenges that you think um, are coming up. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, CAR T cells, for the people who don't know, um, are, well, they fall under the umbrella of immunotherapy, which these days is just a big an umbrella as chemotherapy itself. So there's lots of things. And even within the CAR T cell field, one CAR T cell has very little to do with another CAR T cell. And the reason for that is what CAR T cells are is you take out a patient's white blood cells because one of the jobs of your immune system should be to fight abnormal cells as they're becoming cancer or after they've formed cancer. Mm -hmm. So if you have a tumor that's formed, your immune system by definition has failed to eliminate that problem, Mm -hmm. but your immune system otherwise is probably working fantastic. So you have bacteria on your skin, you have fungus on your skin, where you have all these pathogens that are coming at us all the time and our immune systems are taking care of them. Mm -hmm. So most children with cancer have great immune systems, but are just missing this one obviously critical thing. So the type of immunotherapy CAR T cells are is we take out some of their white blood cells from the blood, an amount that they wouldn't miss. We send it to the lab and we genetically engineer it. So those white blood cells now have a new receptor that's sticking on the top. And that receptor should be able to interact with the tumor and eliminate it and then move to the next cell and eliminate it. So they can be like serial killers of tumor cells. Mm -hmm. Um, This technology was started for leukemia um, and in pediatric leukemia in 2013, um, a couple sites had trials, Seattle children specifically had a trial called PLAT1. And that trial was for children with recurrent leukemia using a CAR T cell targeting it. And 93% of those kids went from having leukemia to being in a remission. Mm. We don't use that word a lot in pediatric neuro oncology, but it means your disease is not detectable. And then about 60% of those patients ended up being long-term survivors. So for a phase one clinical trial, that's like a ridiculously positive result. You know, Mm -hmm. like we've run 250 clinical trials for DIPG is the number people tend to throw around Mm -hmm. without really ever improving survival by like weeks. And so this was dramatic and um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia had similar results other sites have now. And so immediately people wanted to bring this technology to other places. Right. So when I came to Seattle, one of the goals was to make a CAR T cell program for pediatric brain tumors. Mm. And in the lab, Mike Jensen had already, who had been running our program here and previously was at City of Hope, which was the first place to treat adults with brain tumors with CAR T cells. Mm. And so he developed CAR T cells in his lab that were targeting a couple specific antigens, which are surface markers on the tumor. 
And he and I talked about what is the best order to go after these things and what are the best targets to use. And we came up with a list and pretty quickly in succession, we opened three trials that are all targeting each a different thing mm. because we think the goal ultimately is going to feed into your question about limitations. So mm. the differences with brain tumors, there's two primary differences. One is when you're treating leukemia, you're giving CAR T cells into the blood and mm. that's exactly where a leukemia is. Mm -hmm. So you're giving the CAR T cell exactly into the compartment where it is. For brain tumors, you can give things into the blood, but they don't cross into the brain very well. And they yeah. certainly don't stay there. And then even within the brain, there's different compartments that seem to have even worse uptake of things like the pons is probably one of those. And that's where DIPG is. Mm -hmm. So even when drugs get into the brain, they often don't get into the pons. Yeah. So getting in is tough. Um, and then the second thing is, this is a generalization, but leukemia is mostly a clonal disease. So you have a trillion leukemia cells, 99.9% .9 of them are the exact same cell that has copied itself because they're free floating single cells in the blood. Yeah. For brain tumors, you have this conglomerate of different cell types that are forming a ball mm -hmm. and really disgustingly and upsettingly, the cells are like working together, neurologic signaling, sharing resources, working as a community to stay alive. And not all of the cells are the same. Okay. And so when you're doing, we have the same problem with genetic targets and other things is not all the cells are identical. So eventually I think we'll need ways to get into the brain and the specific area really efficiently. Mm -hmm. And we'll need CAR T cells that target more than one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't, we couldn't do the multi-targeting right away because when you're writing a trial, you have to show to the FDA that the individual components are safe before you combine things. Mm -hmm. So we opened the three trials, hoping to get to a place where we can combine them all, which yeah. we hope to open next year. Where we're delivering them, that is something we could address right away. So right from the very first patient we treated in 2018, we made the decision, the best way to get patients treated is directly into the brain. Mm -hmm. So we place an omaya, which is a little plastic bubble that's at the scalp and is connected to a catheter that goes into the brain. Mm -hmm. And that gives us that little blub bubble. You can put a needle in and the CAR T cells just come in a small volume. Yeah. And so we just infuse right through there. It goes mm -hmm. through the catheter. We know that they get into the brain from other things that we've done. Mm -hmm. And from animal studies that we've done here and even um, larger, um, more specific studies that they did at City of Hope, they've shown that getting CAR T cells into the brain directly is much more effective than the blood and animal models. And so most of the adult trials have been directly into the brain. And so mm -hmm. that's what we decided to do. Um, but that's kind of where our trials currently are and why we're doing them. I mean, when we treat, we have mice that we give brain tumors to in the lab, yeah. and then we treat them with CAR T cells and we get their tumors to melt away, which is dramatic. So yeah. for most of the drugs we study in the lab, if mice are living a couple days longer, a couple weeks longer, you show statistical significance, you get a nice publication yeah. out of it. It's something that's interesting and hopefully will be impactful. But, you know, whether it's CHOP or whether it's Stanford or whether it's us, when we treat with CAR T cells in the brain tumor mice, mm -hmm. the tumor just melts away and it's incredibly dramatic, um, which I think also fuels our excitement. Right. The huge caveat to that is that our mice generate for the most part, don't have an immune system. Like mm. that's how we can implant a tumor. If the mice had an immune system, like if you took a mouse off the street, put a pediatric brain tumor in its brain, it wouldn't grow because the mouse would eliminate it. So we have to use mice that don't have an immune system, implant a tumor, get it to grow. And so then we give CAR T cells and we're introducing an immune system to a place that it really has never had a normal one. Yeah. And so sometimes, well, I think we all appreciate our results look artificially good. Right. But they still look way better than anything else, which is why we're so excited about moving forward. I see. Okay, cool. I didn't actually know that about the, um, that that's what it looks like in the mice that they kind of just, that's, way that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then I guess to switch gears a little bit um, and back to more of the clinical, um, your clinical side of your work. Um, is there like a moment that you remember um, really well that like, I don't know, change your perspective as a doctor or um, in DIPG specifically, whether that's, I don't know, um, something you came across in research or like a patient, something that had a lasting impact on you? Yeah. I mean, I think there were two families that I got really close to 
at Stanford. Um, your brother is obviously one of them. Um, I think, you know, I talked to your parents a lot during his care. Yeah. Socially, professionally talking about trials. And uh, Mithil was at Stanford when I was there, but then was also at UCSF for a while mm -hmm. and looked at other places. And I think I continued to stay in touch when he left the hospital yeah. and was doing other things along his path. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was really important for me because, you know, it's different when you're training at certain points. Because like when I was at NYU and I had that first new diagnosis talk with the DAVG mm -hmm. patient, you have a million other responsibilities, you know, like I was doing like the spinal taps and the bone marrow <laughs> samples for the new leukemia patients mm -hmm. and covering things overnight. And you just can't form relationships in the same way because yeah. you're training and you're doing other things. Yeah. And that was the first time. I mean, it was great that Stanford actually gave me the protected time to do it. Um, but some of it was just like my own interest in like staying close with families throughout mm -hmm. all the steps of the process. Yeah. And I think I kind of hate it when, researchers talk too much about how patients inspire them because mm -hmm. like they're more than that. Yeah. Um, but I think working with your brother, you know, maintaining a close relationship throughout showed me like what's possible and that you can still hopefully be somewhat of a positive influence. One, even if you're not offering a cure, Mm -hmm. and two if they're not even still at your institution and now I actually yeah. do that a lot so I probably talk to 100 DIPG families a year mm -hmm. um, and 10 of them would be like our own Seattle Children's New Diagnoses mm -hmm. and then maybe another 20 come here for clinical trials so there's like 70 families that I'll never meet yeah um, and I stay close to them and there's a handful of families right now I could name the kid and all of their siblings and the parents' names and tell you like their favorite playground <laughs> or like what shirt they always wearing the pictures. But like, I've never actually met these people. Mm -hmm. We've just done Zoom calls and yeah. telemedicine interactions or just on the phone. Some of these people have my cell phone and we're just like, I get text pictures of the kids. <laughs> um, and I think that um, I hope that has a positive experience for them. Mm -hmm. And I think I learned that through my fellowship. I think there's another family um, that I was really close to who had a young girl who was yeah. a similar situation where I've stayed in really close touch with that family. The parents are amazing and still um, go visit children's hospitals and drop off gifts and do a bunch of things. And I stayed close with them throughout their care. And they were always at Stanford for their care, I think. Mm -hmm. But even at the end, um, they were admitted to a hospital that was closer to them for the yeah. last few days. Yeah. And I remember calling that hospital like daily, like giving updates, talking about things. Yeah. Um, and so I still have to do that. The kids who enroll in our clinical trials go to other hospitals mm -hmm. and I have to stay involved in their care. Um, and it's like a different skill set or mentality to think of. Like, I don't think of my patients as being in the walls of Seattle Children's, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of, which is not something you get prepared for in medical training. Like most of your yeah. medical training, like 99% of it is how can you make the person who's sitting in front of you better? Mm -hmm. Not how can you make the person in Virginia that you've never met in person? Yeah. Uh, and you don't actually talk to them as much about like their overall care, but like how they're processing everything. Like, how yeah. do you be a good provider for that person? Uh, it's not something that you're really taught about how to do. Um, but I think that little girl at Stanford and your brother kind of taught me and were inspirational on how to have this like long-term relationship with people, even mm -hmm. if they're not in front of you the whole step of the way. Yeah. Well, my brother really liked you too. I think you were <laughs> his most favorite doctor and he loved coming and talking to you. So yeah, it was like a silver lining, I guess, for him, I think. Well, um, I... Loved hearing about his baseball, and it's still one of the funniest guys I ever took care of. Yeah, his sense of humor, I think, was unmatched. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to ask you is, what is one piece of advice or something you would say to a newly diagnosed family? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I have a five-year-old. Um, no matter what serious illness he had, 
I would talk to another institution about what was going on with him. Mm -hmm. Even if you walked in the door of Seattle Children's, which I think is one of the top handful of hospitals in the country. And I think that, you know, your child's health is so important Mm -hmm. and that it's so hard, you know, there's not like Yelp reviews for medicine. Like Mm -hmm. it's really hard to know. You can have a fantastic doctor who's incredible and will be super important to your care every single step of the way but takes care of one patient with DIPG every couple of years. Right. Yeah. And just like I was saying in training, you don't have time to spend time with people. Mm -hmm. There's some people that are in certain medical situations where they just don't have time for other things. The same way that now that I'm doing more lab work, I don't have as much time to spend with patients physically as I would like. Mm -hmm. There's patients who have other jobs where they are taking care of everybody with a bleeding disorder, everybody with Mm -hmm. leukemia, Maybe they're even overnight covering an emergency room. Like you don't know what the whole scope of their job is and they aren't allowed to have as much dedicated brain space Mm -hmm. for a certain type of thing. And then you get to other people who either because they've been really fortunate or because they always wanted to do that, ended up in a role where they are hyper-focused on one thing. And by nature, you know, those people are going to be the ones who are going to the conferences that are getting updates every couple of weeks, you know, like me and Javed and Sabina, and Carl Koshman, like, we're on the phone together, like every other week, like there's not going to be a new trial that makes an impact. And we don't know in like 30 seconds. Right. (laughs) Um, Whereas it would be really easy to be a general oncologist and not know for like years until you happen to hear that talk at a meeting because publications and other things lag so far behind. So I think every family deserves to try to find some for lack of a better word, DIPG center of excellence. That's probably somewhere in their geographic sphere. And there's a bunch of hospitals that fall into this. I mean, like, I don't want to be exclusive about things, but like Atlanta, CHLA, Stanford, UCSF, um, Colorado, Lurie in Chicago, mm-hmm. a bunch of New York hospitals, CHOP, DC, yeah. um, Boston. There's a lot of these places where you'll be able to interact with somebody that for most part thinks primarily about DIPG. Yeah. And I still take care of a fair amount of kids or get second opinions who either had a biopsy when they didn't need one, Mm. didn't have a biopsy when they should have, Mm -hmm. got craniospinal radiation when they just needed it to their brain, Mm. Um, never got a spine MRI to look to see if they have metastases, Mm. Um, got proton radiation, which is totally unnecessary for DAPG. And they could have just done regular photon radiation to make closer to home and maybe even had less side effects. Um, You know, what clinical trials are options? A lot of families still think conventional chemotherapy doesn't do anything for DIPG and there's, it's not a totally um, thing that everyone shares across the board, but there's some of us that do think there are some conventional prescribable drugs that do have some benefit and you can counsel families on what that benefit is and is it a good fit for you and your kid, but you should know that it's an option and at least some people think that way. Um, And then clinical trials are just, it's not feasible from an organizational perspective to have every clinical trial open at every place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like our CAR T cell trials are only open here. Hopefully we're going to start having partner institutions. Like our leukemia trials are open at multiple institutions Mm -hmm. for CAR T cells and our brainchild studies will be one day too, but they're not now. They have to be here just because of the local expertise and regulatory parts of doing it. So some things are available that just aren't close to you, not because your team's not excellent, but just because it wasn't possible to open it there. And it's very easy to not know what are all, I don't know every DIPG trial that's open in the country. I can rattle off like 10 of them pretty quickly, but I'm sure I would miss some that there's a family somewhere on that thinks is really important or impactful. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think the number one thing I would tell the families is try to reach out to a place or a person who primarily focuses on this. Yeah. You found out your child has a fatal brain tumor. This is an impossible situation. You probably already are connected to somebody who's excellent and will take excellent care of you, whatever mm-hmm. type of hospital it is. But there are some people who just spend a little bit more time thinking about this and they might not change how many days your child will live, but they might impact how prepared you are for what will happen. They might impact what the quality of those days are. Yeah. They might impact, you know, what waiting lists you could get on for clinical trials that could potentially make a difference. So I don't think it takes, uh, I think your doctor will be supportive of you wanting to do that. I tell all of my patients, you should get a second opinion, whether it's Chop or Boston or UCSF, 
you know, you deserve to talk to someone else. So uh, even though I think I get considered as one of the DAPG people, I still encourage my patients to talk to one other place. I talk to Sabina's patients all the time at UCSF, even though Sabina is probably the best neuro-oncologist in the world. But like, you know, she doesn't have to send patients to me because I have something groundbreaking that she doesn't have available, but it's a different perspective and another person that can validate some of the things you're thinking about. So um, that's probably the advice I'd give. I think that's, I think this came up a lot actually um, during our breakfast at the Cure Fest too. It's, I think something that everyone should hear, I think at least once from their doctor. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's all that I have for you. Um, But thank you so much for taking the time out to answer my questions and being on the podcast. Um, Yeah, I really enjoyed having you. Yeah, thanks. It's really great to see you. And thanks for the invitation to come and speak. Of course. Thank you, Dr. Vitanza, for taking the time out of your busy, busy schedule to sit and talk with me. I really enjoyed our conversations and I've learned a lot and found it informative. That's it for this week's episode of Hear the Rare. To our audience members, as always, please like and subscribe to our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram pages. You can also find us on all the podcasting websites as well. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out at hearthererare at gmail.com. In addition, if you know someone or you yourself would like to be on the podcast, please reach out to us. And lastly, for this week's gratitude, I would just like to say that I'm so grateful for dedicated doctors such as Dr. Vitanza, who brought a lot of comfort to my family during a time when we really had no hope at all. And there are many, many doctors who have provided the same type of comfort for other families. And so I'm so thankful that they are there. They're willing to help us in the ways that they do, because I think one of the main reasons we are able to make it through this hard journey is because of them. So thank you. And for all our listeners, I'll see you next time on Hear the Rare.